Okay, fantastic. We are now live and one minute early as well, which is always always a bonus <laughs> when we can actually yeah, get it up and running before before time. Normally yeah. um we end up kind of crawling in at like two minutes, three minutes past, um yeah. or um a little bit or I think it's five five thirty in your time, isn't it? Or four thirty, sorry. In your four thirty, yeah. 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 <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, do let us know in the comments that you can hear us and see us all right, just so we get that feedback to know that we're not broadcasting into kind of nothingness. <laughs> um, very exciting day coming up or interview coming up today as we've got the amazing Sindor um, Pangal, who is the director of Box um, and a canine behaviourist and does lots of fantastic things. And I think probably the, the best way to kind of get um, a bit of an idea about you rather than me trying to remember remember all the amazing <laughs> things you do is if you could perhaps just introduce yourself a little bit and and tell us a bit about yourself sure so uh hello for whoever has uh, is joining <laughs> us here I must say that um uh I know that a lot of you are dealing with the very cold days but uh it's quite hot here it's summer in 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 south india already we're in the peak of summer so please excuse me if i look a little flushed it's just it's not the topic it's not the conversation it's just it's quite hot um so hi i'm sindur pangal uh, i am a canine behavior consultant and a canine myotherapist i did my myotherapy diploma with gallen in the uk and i studied with ture drogas um i uh, i'm currently more of an educator i'm the director and the principal at box box is where we uh, offer a, a uk accredited level 4 diploma on um, applied ethology and uh applied behavior is not the right word but the right word is a little daunting it's what we do is biosocial psychology which is kind of bringing together the biology the, the social aspects of a social being and uh, the psychological aspects to see what behavior is and of course an understanding of ethology and uh we also offer a short workshop that kind of introduces you to the box way of doing things uh you know what does it really mean to bring in ethology into all of these uh aspects of an animal currently i'm doing my masters at exeter in the uk on um anthrozoology which is a offering from the anthropology department so it's kind of uh, but bringing in the animal into the conversation so we look at human animal entanglements um across history across geographies across different uh uh media uh, industries so on and so forth and that's of a lot of interest for me because i started out with uh, research on free living animals or animals that i call streeties and i'm so excited about people using that term um so um and ethological studies are best done on free living animals. So I was looking at that and then this kind of masters came my way and it's excellent because I'm now kind of moving from quantitative number based research to qualitative research on uh, free living animals. So looking instead of looking at ethology, I'm looking at a little more of ethnographies and animal biographies and things like that, because I feel like there's so many rich stories to tell about these dogs, these free living dogs, that numbers were very limiting. So I really wanted to um, uh, bring to you, find effective ways to bring to the world those rich, rich stories that uh, uh, that these animals have. So that's what I currently do. Fantastic. So uh, there are quite a few things on your plate at the moment then. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it's an amazing subject, anthropology, isn't it? Because there's so many different ways that you can study it and learn about it, whether you kind of looking at kind of genome level data or looking at kind of more kind of historical data. It's just, I mean, it, it must be fascinating having that kind of breadth of sources that you can choose from as well. Um and um, I also, yeah, I love the fact that you're doing qualitative research. I think, I mean, there's kind of been an attitude, hasn't there, in um, in kind of science and particularly, I think, recently in kind of some of the more so social science um, regions that, that 
I think by trying to almost become very sciencey, very sort of um, data driven and shed any sort of idea that they're non-scientific, the qualitative research has been kind of maybe a bit sniffed at, maybe maybe kind of looked down upon. And yeah. I think that's really changing recently. Um, yeah. I've certainly seen in the dog world, but also kind of things that are coming out in in research more generally, um, yeah. which which is really nice because, like you say, you do get these beautiful interactions between animals, between humans and animals, between humans and humans, animals and animals, that it's really hard to actually kind of um, pin down into data points and um, numbers yeah. and quantitative yeah. data, isn't it? Yeah, that's very reductionist. So if we're going to try and put numbers to it, that's that's literally why I went into the master's because I'm an engineer, I'm drawn to numbers. And so I tried doing that and I just could not do justice to what I was seeing in front of me and it was frustrating for me because when I tried to give you numbers and this is kind of an example that I like to talk about when uh, if you look at ethology for instance um, and you say what are dogs capable of and if you say I want data for it you're really going to only get the common denominator you're only going to get what 90% of the dogs do or, you know, a statistically significant number of the dogs or the population of the dogs do. Whereas when you ask the question, what are humans capable of? Look at the richness we bring in. We are capable of landing on the moon. Not all of us are, not 90%, not even 9%, not even 0.9%, but we are capable of landing on the moon. We are capable of painting the Sistine Chapel. We are capable of, you know, art and architecture and so on and so forth. And I think there's, there's value to finding the common denominator, which is to say, what is a dog physiologically? But there's also much value in asking uh, those sort of deeper questions. And those can only be uncovered by stories. Those, uh, you know, those thick descriptions, those really uh, heavy words that we use to describe um, actions of these dogs, their social interactions, for instance. I watch what's going on out here on the farm between the farm dogs and my dogs. And, uh, and I've been talking to my professors about it. And, you know, I keep telling them, I can't find words other than things like, there's politics between them and they play dirty politics. <laughs> they, you know, they, there's, there's affection, there is love, there is uh, caregiving, but there's also kind of uh, friendships in the true nature of friendships, that changing dynamic of friendships. Friendships are not static. Friendships are not, uh, can you prove that 99% of the dogs form friendships? No. Is, is that the way human friendships work? No, not really. Um, and and uh, sort of the qualitative aspects of friendship, different dogs, different individuals experience and express friendships differently. That kind of a richness can't be brought through with numbers. And if we choose not to look past numbers, we as professionals and people who uh, claim to love dogs we're shortchanging ourselves we are not bringing in what is necessary for the discussion we want to understand these individuals who live in our homes and experience these you know wonderful complicated messy emotions and for us to understand it we can't say that we're going to stop our understanding at what the numbers can tell us um, then we're we're kind of heading back into kind of this Cartesian idea of uh, you know, reducing animals to machines or automatons. They're not. And we've known that for a long time. But what does it mean to accept that they're not machines? They're sentient beings with a richness of social life. What does that mean? For that, I think we need qualitative studies. And I think studies is also important because it's not just me telling a story. It's me telling a story with a certain amount of credibility, with backing it with a certain amount of literature, a certain amount of thought process um, and and reflexivity, you know, I'm bringing in the knowledge that this is a story at the end of the day. And how do I present that in a way that's going to be useful for you? I think that uh, that discipline, um, that academic discipline is also necessary. Yeah, yeah, I think I completely agree. And I think um, one thing that occurs to me as well, though, is, is when you were talking about um, that kind of norm or kind of finding that behavioral norm is 
kind of what what the function of that is if you're doing research you find a behavioral norm what does that do for for carers of dogs and people that are working with dogs or dogs that don't fit that behavioral norm because it's kind of starts setting them up as um kind of deviating from the norm or not there being something wrong with them or there being being kind of some sort of pathology um with them if we're talking about behavior problem potentially and I think that can not only be problematic in the way we view the dog and the issues that the dog may be having but also problematic for the for the caregiver of the dog because then they might start feeling that but you know there's something they need something wrong with their dog they need to fix their dog but actually their dog may be expressing behavior or <laughs> sort of existing in a way that is nice and happy and good for them yeah and isn't that true of humans as well right i mean i think when we start kind of uh, defining these uh what is what is considered normal defining these boxes and we try shoehorning people into it uh it 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 is very, very limiting and it is exhausting. It's, you know, we constantly, we feel like we're work in progress. I've seen so many people when I talk to them and their struggles with mental health and things like that, they don't, it's always, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It's work in progress. And I feel terrible. You know, I, I feel tired just looking at them because I know you've been trying so hard to fit into somebody else's description of what is right. And nobody is looking at you for who you are and what your needs are and your need as an individual may be very very different from the entire rest of the world who cares you're still an individual who's who has needs and and if if you're lucky and i hope each of us are you're going to find some other individuals to meet that need for you and make your journey through this life a little bit easier a little bit more pleasant and uh, in a way that is a little bit more fulfilling for you yeah. And I think we need to do that for ourselves. And really the message that I, this message that I carry for dogs, for me has been a reminder to myself, stop beating myself up. I don't fit. I don't fit into any box. I don't fit into anything. And for, for a long time, I tried to, uh, uh, you know, see myself as a work in progress, polish, polish, try to get it right. But now I've been reminding myself, be kind on Chiru, be kind on Sindur. Both of you, it's okay. Who you are is fine. Just see who can meet your need and how you can meet your own need and do that for the dogs. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's so powerful just to, just to think about and reflect upon yourself because there are, yeah, there's just so much that we see in our human society um, in terms of expectations of, as you say, fitting someone else's someone else's description of what is right um and isn't that yes yeah, so applicable to dogs as well because of course dogs behave in such a way that they really try so hard not to fit into a description of what's right so much of the time don't they they adapt to us just so incredibly and then we often turn around and say actually that's not enough or that's not right or you're getting this wrong and it, it's it's yeah it's quite sad to think about that you know they've done so much in terms yes. of adapting to us and then we think that's that's not enough yeah i i mean uh, think about it right and for me because i have a very cross-cultural exposure it this is this is a little bit easier for me to understand and people who have had cross-cultural exposure will understand when I travel and spend some time in another country, when I spend some time interacting with people of other countries and other cultures, I often find that what they take for granted, what they take, uh, would think is absolutely the most normal thing to do isn't for me. Um, and I, if I have to uh, fit into their world, which I try my best to do when I'm traveling, I try my best to fit into the home of the host that I'm in. And I realize that, there's a lot that I have to learn. And there's a, there's, there are many boundaries that I cross without realizing it. There are things that I do that I don't mean to. Uh, and it's the same is true for people who come into my home. I have a lot of guests who come in from different parts of the world. And I see that they do things that is just not acceptable in my part of the world. But it's not that they're wrong. It's just, it's cultural. Now, amongst humans, if we have this, Think about it. We're getting another species into our homes and we have all these rules in our minds of what a domestic animal is supposed to be. Uh, and we kind of 
expect it of them. We push them into it. We force them into it. Um, we shame them into it. We do that with human beings too. But uh, in the process, we are taking away their uh, ability to be their authentic selves and if we do that if we're connecting with them as sentient individuals but we take away their opportunity to be their authentic selves we are never going to see the best of them we are never going to experience the absolute best of them uh, again in a relationship if we are not going to allow that individual to put their best forward we stand to lose we stand to miss out on a great opportunity to enjoy this being who can connect with us and add so much richness into our lives. I, I write about this in my book too. I think the first few years I had Nishi, I was trying to get her to be this and that. And I was fretting and fuming that, you know, she wasn't doing her leash walks well. She wasn't obedient. She wasn't this and that. And then years later, when I changed the way I was thinking about things, and I think one of the very last times that I went out on a vacation with her and, and my late husband, <laughs> Uh, it's uh, the, the depth of that experience really is it's hitting me now. And mm -hmm. I remember sitting there and thinking and talking to my husband and I said, gosh, I lost so many years obsessing over trying to get her to fit. But uh, she's perfect. She's amazing. And I didn't see those things as long as I was trying to get her to fit. I didn't see how good she was with puppies, how good she was with um, conflict resolution, how good she was with communication with other dogs and the extraordinary patience that she had. I mean, she had so many qualities. There's a whole book I've written about it. Um, and I couldn't see a lot of that. And um and I remember having that discussion and, you know, and a tear trickling down my eye and thinking I lost precious years of a very short life. Um, now, both of them are gone. My husband's gone. Nishi's gone as well. And it hits me even more. And I would appeal to anybody out there who's starting on this journey. You know, if you need to see what is, you need to let go of what you want to see. See what is and appreciate it. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I think... You know that's really kind of moving to 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 hear about. To be honest, um, you know the, the the I think that's so powerful. That I mean, what you the the sort of the the depth of experience that you kind of go into with that in in dog nose. I think I mean it's it's just so moving to kind of think about that. That just the importance of appreciating what's there and what you have kind of been gifted with with. Obviously, in your case, it was Nishi, um, who sounded like just the loveliest dog and the most sort of kind, kind dog to other other dogs, other people. Um, the kind of some of those experiences that you write about with her interacting with other puppies. I think when you foster a few puppies, right? Um, that's just you know, it's, it's 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 yeah, it's really really sort of powerful just to read about, and I think even though actually it's something when you read that you think actually we, we see little things like that a lot in our life actually these things are happening all the time but we don't always stop to appreciate them yeah um so it's it's a good yeah it's a very very um powerful book all around I would say because there's lots of dog books that are, that are written and they're going to give you facts about dogs but it's yeah it also kind of makes you rethink things a little bit as well which is which is yeah, yeah. I think what we all need to kind of stop and reflect sometimes on on some of those kind of small moments um, that are really, really powerful. Um, and I think something else actually, um, talking of dog nose, that I really liked about dog nose is kind of um, the, the your description of your experience of being a new dog owner, because that's something, or dog, dog parents are um, so kind of trapped in that language growing up in the UK of saying dog owner. Um, and it's something it's something that I try and change in myself, but um, it's really hard to to change the the language that you get used to, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but um, I yeah, I I don't in in my head think that it's the best term, um, but it's so automatic that I still say it um, sometimes. But um, yeah, so I think um, so yeah, you you talk about that kind of experience of being a new pet parent and. Um, I think that's something that we, particularly people in the in the in the dog industry, kind of forget what that's like to just really know nothing, <laughs> really kind of not know what you're doing, not 
overfeed your dog do kind of silly things that I mean I, I remember when I first got my dog I did <laughs> it's kind of it was a checklist actually some of the things you went there I was like oh yeah I did that I did that <laughs> it's like we all do those just silly things when we first get a dog um my journey was a little bit more recently I think I got my first dog in 2018 so not not long ago at all um really um yeah but um so uh, going off topics, one thing I did want to ask you about actually that that came up in that came up was a thought from me from, from dog noses is obviously you have um entered kind of the the kind of the the dog care or the dog 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 world, whatever we call it, fairly recently. So sort of 10 plus years ago, not yeah, a little bit a little over 10 years ago, yeah. Yeah. And and obviously, Nishi was your first dog. Is, is that right? As an ad- adult in my own yeah. home, I grew up with dogs, but yeah. as an adult in my own home, and as, uh, as yeah. the responsible carer, yeah. yeah. I think so. Do you think kind of coming in, and then obviously very soon, kind of in your dog journey with Nishi, you kind of got that training with Turid and, and and kind of went into that journey of becoming a, a behavior professional? Do you think that's kind of helped you in a way, in the sense that you haven't got so caught up in any particular strong culture around dogs so for example you weren't you didn't spend (laughs) 30 years as someone might have thinking the most important thing in life is heel walking or this Mm. or that um yeah yeah Yeah, I think part of it is that and part of it is also that you know uh this whole thing happened for me in India which means that we don't have uh the whole industry per se is a very nascent industry in India Uh, the idea of training uh, dogs uh, just two generations ago if I went to uh, my uh, uh, grandparents uh, home and I said I want to be a dog trainer they would just laugh at it saying you're training a dog to be what a dog <laughs> like it, it you know it's just it's not a concept that was understood so I think I didn't uh, grow up in though we grew up with dogs around I didn't grow up in a culture where I saw dogs being um, uh, sort of molded and fit into and this is a form of biopower right which is kind of you will behave the way I want you to behave and I didn't I didn't really see that I think culturally also I'm a little bit more used to animals being allowed to be what they want to be we may like them or we hate them but we still see them as animals uh, being allowed to be what they they are uh, kind of true to themselves Uh, so I think that also made a difference in that you know I wasn't very entrenched in what I had seen I didn't grow up with these ideas so it it wasn't difficult for me and I'm very very glad that I ran into Turid very early on uh, when I needed help for Nishi Uh, one of the I I contacted many people many big names in the (laughs) industry Um, and I tried many things but uh, with Nishi we were dealing with trauma and one thing that I realized at that time was trauma no matter how you look at it trauma is not something that's going to go away with training that just didn't make sense to me I knew that I needed something more than training um car ran over her face so she was dealing with a lot so um I think uh, the fact that uh, Turid's idea also appealed to me at that time because she was not really talking about training and she was talking about things that seemed relevant for emotional uh, uh, regulation and emotional recovery. Um, She was talking about communication. She was talking about uh, helping them, understanding their emotions. So I think that also was very serendipitous for me. I found the right person, right time, you know, things lined up and I must give credit where credit's due my late husband was definitely a very strong influence in my life and he felt very strongly about this he felt very strongly about uh, I mean he was madly in love with Nishi and he he could see the bright side of her right from the day one and he didn't want to change anything about her Uh, he just was smitten by this dog and um, I think he came from a strong place of empathy he connected with her very strongly so I write I read about it in the book as well where I had, would make calls to him when I was learning with Turi to say you were right I was wrong <laughs> <Just apologize. laughs> yeah. so I think uh, all those things added up to help me arrive at where I am 
Yeah, I mean that that's fantastic, and yeah, it's been such a such a um, I think fantastic journey that you've kind of shared with us all as well because so many people now have been able to learn so much from you and your work and um, obviously the work you're doing at Box um, as well so you know oh, thank you as well for kind of everything that you've brought um, to, to, to the industry um, and I, I think um, one topic that I wanted to touch on today is you mentioned biopower um, and I think something as you're saying the kind of the cultural view on dogs is very different in India to the UK so one of the things that I've really learned from from a lot of from a lot of your work and reassessed from reading a lot of and reading and hearing a lot of your work and um, appearances is this kind of um, idea that we have a lot of power over our dogs we have a we we kind of by nature of our relationship um, we have so much power over our dogs and um, yeah. kind of thinking about how 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 do we handle that how do we use that how do we mitigate that as well to help our dogs have as much power and independence as as possible yeah you know that's a very touchy and a very dicey subject actually because the truth is that I think one thing that we do as human beings is um we can't help getting drunk on power (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's just, it it just happens so quickly and so easily. I, I try to be very conscious of it. And I see myself still slipping all the time, all the time, right? Um, it's the second we realize that you have power on somebody. It's, I think, very tempting to um, use that. So it could be, and let's just talk about human beings and you'll see how easy it is. The second I realize that, you want something from me, there's a pullback. There's Im- almost immediate pullback. You want this from me. So let me, you know, there's, there's my uh, there's my bargaining chip. There, there's what I can use. Uh, what can I use it for? Uh, and we don't really think through things. We don't necessarily think think it through that way but it just it just happens maybe it's conditioning maybe we have been taught that this is this is how we survive I don't know what it is um and uh the same thing with uh with us dealing with people uh, somebody recently said to me I said you know I don't want to be I don't want to get tough on dogs I never want to get tough on dogs I always want to have a gentle approach and he said well even with human beings you know you balance off toughness with softness or toughness with gentleness and and I was thinking you know what what are the situations where you get tough on human beings only when we have power over people I don't see too many people getting tough on your boss uh, the day you get tough on your boss is probably the day he or she is going to fire you. So you find a way to do whatever you have to do as gently as possible. You find a way with your boss, but oftentimes with uh, with people who are reporting to you, your uh, people who you have employed or your children, or uh, if there's a power dynamic with uh, spouses or couples, um, there is a time that we kind of pull that card. We use that card, you know, that I am irritated with you I'm annoyed with you or will you please shut up when you should actually be saying what's going on let's talk about it so we want to take that shortcut and we use power when we want to take that shortcut so now the reason I bring up all these examples is now imagine a situation where the the natural thing in our home with the dog is you have all the power you control every aspect of a dog's life from the you know, what the dog eats, where the dog eats, how much, when, what, when does the dog go out to pee, pooping, pee, all the biological functions, where do they sleep, how long can they sleep, uh, all the the um, uh, sort of, you know, the pleasure, the pain, everything, we control everything in their life, so we have an extraordinary amount of power. And so I think it calls, the call to us is to really rise above it and become very, very aware that we have this power and how do we constantly return choices back? How do, what are, what are the places where we can return choices back to the dog? Um, What are the things that they value? Uh, Would they like to have an opinion on what they would like to eat? Now, I can't necessarily offer a buffet every day. But when possible, can I give a choice to say this or this? You can have this for breakfast if you pick this, 
uh, in which case you'll have to have this for dinner because I don't want to throw it away. But um, but at least one meal, you can probably have a choice between A and B. Uh, how much do you want to eat? What time? Maybe I can't change my entire day to work around the dog. But can I give a window of 10 minutes earlier or 10 minutes later? Is that possible? Can I ask the dog which direction they want to walk in? Um, where do you want to sleep? What kind of surfaces do you want to sleep on? Uh, I've seen people work with, with what kind of a harness do you want to wear today? And dogs seem to have a choice sometimes on those things. And and not that, not that it makes a huge difference, but there's that feeling that I'm a, at least a little bit in control of this body of mine, of what goes in it and on it and where it moves. A little bit of control on this body of mine. Uh, a little bit of agency. I think that uh, can go a huge way in um, improving the emotional health of these these family members of ours. Yeah, and I think that's really nice to kind of get those practical examples as well, because it's not like, and I think perhaps when you hear about these things, you think, oh, you know, this means we have to get our dogs do whatever they want and bend over backwards. But actually, the kind of the things you just mentioned, they're very practical. They're actually, that's, that's not a massive thing to do, but it could make a big difference to your dog's life. Yeah. And something that made me think of there as well, you mentioned the harnesses, there's kind of two, two approaches you could have there, right? If you see a dog that doesn't want to wear their harness, you could say, actually, you know what, we're going to get the clicker out. We're going to get, we're going to train this dog to wear the harness. We're going to reinforce it. We're going to counter condition this harness if there's a aversion to it or whatever. Or you can say, actually, what about one of these harnesses? And yeah. It seems to me that, you know, we know that we can, <laughs> in most cases, come to condition the dog to the harness and often we'll be able to get that dog to walk really nicely on the harness. But kind of your point raises the question of actually, is that the best outcome for the dog? And it's, yeah, poss possibly not. Yeah. And uh, and also when you start taking that approach where you're not, and I, I, counter conditioning is such, such a... Uh, complicated thing because we know that we can get them to comply we don't necessarily know that we can change their emotional state that we don't have evidence of so let's let's not you know mix the two uh, and, and that that is the danger right that is the danger that you're faced with when you try to counter condition you really don't know whether you you know whether you're smiling at me because you're happy with me or you're smiling at me because I've paid you to smile at me, right? So you 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 don't know that. And so you are in dangerous territory. And the reason I'm saying dangerous is uh, now with harnesses, when dogs have kind of pushed back on harnesses, we always do a deep dive. We try to understand what's going on. Many, many times we have discovered that those are some of the first signs that we get of, say, spondylosis. Uh, they have a back pain. That's why they're not able to handle the harness. And this could be one of the very early signs. Or they have, uh, uh, they're hypersensitive to touch. They they do have some touch sensitivity, or they're suffering from pain in the neck. So that's why they're kind of pushing back on it. Some dogs that are fearful like a tighter harness, whereas some dogs really want something loose and light. In a country like India, uh, first thing that I think of is what is the temperature. Many of those harnesses. Are uh, big harnesses and you know when they go for a five minute walk and come back and I put a hand inside the harness I, I swear I can bake a cookie in there it's so hot uh, and we don't think about these things uh, and it's it's hard for us to be empathetic about it unless we take a moment to think about it and I think uh, taking away that kind of a uh, biopower off the table and saying, uh, uh, don't, don't, I'm not going to give myself license to do that. I'm going to try and figure out why this dog is pushing back on this harness. Uh, is, you know, is there a different kind that I can work with frequently gives me clues into something else that's happening with the dog. And that's critical. Yeah. And I think that's, that's so important as well, isn't it? That kind of using those areas of perhaps kind of conflict or how do you might see them as information sources as well yeah. and kind of thing actually yeah what can we learn about the, the dog from that what is the dog trying to communicate with us and um, and um, that so yeah I think yeah so so many kind of fascinating topics that you, you're touching on there so um <laughs> trying to think where we go next um one thing um that I didn't want to ask you about as well so we talked a little bit about kind of some methods of restriction within kind of harnesses collars and um i think that's something that that as, as you say you know we, we often have to use those we often have to pick our harness but 
I think you've given some great ideas there in terms of how we can offer some more choice in those situations, how we can assess the situation to see actually if there's an underlying reason that we need to address that that dog um, isn't wearing, um, what, or isn't wanting to wear a harness. What about other sources of restriction or, or power that we kind of use over our dogs? I mean, one thing, one thing that I did want to touch on today is the use of crates. Um, so I know that's quite an emotive topic um, yeah. within within our industry as well. And um, yeah. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a difficult topic because uh, um, uh, the second we start kind of going in there, people get uh, very um, uh, panicky about uh, this tool that they have been using for a long time. Now, it's a tool at the end of the day, much like a harness. It's a tool, much like a leash. It's a tool and it has its place. Um, there are places where I use crates, especially if air travel is involved or um post-surgery convalescence is involved uh, and, you know, the animal should not be moving at all, uh, then that kind of a confinement um, is probably necessary. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, air travel is where crates kind of came into the world. Uh, not air travel, uh, just travel, transport. But uh, but that apart, I think we should it, should, it should not be a tool that we are using blindly. Uh, and I think the reason we should be asking about it is the idea of confining an animal can be very, very stressful for animals that have evolved to move. Movement for animals that have evolved to move, movement is survival. It is uh, an absolute need. It is it is safety, it is security, it is life itself. And so for any animal that is capable of moving, if we actually put them in a situation where they can't move away, where they, their movement is restricted, it can make them panic because that is the first thing, flight or fight, right? And both involve movement. <laughs> so that is the very first thing that animals would want to do. Ideally, move away, fly, flight, uh, ideally. It's it's really an inelastic need. Um, and so there's, it's it's really interesting for me because there's, there's like a huge body of uh, evidence. Uh, I, I kind of started researching this to see what, what is the literature out there in terms of confinement and how does it impact welfare of animals and uh, how many different animals have these been tested on. And just the volume of literature we got was, it blew my mind. I, I was reading it for days on end um, and I'll, I'll see if I can share some yeah. of that literature with you guys. Is, um, is that looking at kind of animals within zoos primarily? So I think they've looked at uh, lots of contexts, right? We confine mm -hmm. animals in a lot of different contexts. So <laughs> zoos, uh, 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 labs, um, uh, farms, so many, many different contexts. And what's, what was interesting is many, many, many different kinds of animals. Uh, in fact, even animals that are used to living in very small confined spaces. So the recent example that I was giving somebody, I found examples of snakes. Snakes live under rocks out here. They, they live in like tiny little <laughs> crevices in my in my wall. And, uh, and e even those animals, when we restrict their movement, when we take that freedom of movement away from them, when we confine them, their welfare drops, stress levels increase. Uh, and worse still is when it's solitary confinement, when they're not confined with conspecifics for social animals and the reverse for uh, solitary animals when they're confined in close proximity where they can sense another member of the species. Both cases, the kind of confinement uh, can cause, cause a huge amount of um, stress response in their body. And there's evidence with dogs too, uh, which has been kind of looked at in various different contexts. So, I think it should not be surprising for us. It should not be surprising for us at all because even with human beings, think about it. Uh, what what do we do when there are members of society that we feel we want to punish? We confine them. We put them in jail. And if we want to punish them further, we put them in solitary confinement. So it's more confinement. Like we know that confinement can be, and this lockdown has taught us all this, confinement, restricting movement can be so stressful on individuals that are designed to move. And so I think we have to keep that in mind when we use a tool like a crate, which is that it is, 
it is a very extreme form of confinement. We are confining them to a very small place. Dogs can go stir crazy even if you lock them inside a home, right? Give them a full home. And that's what happened to us in the lockdown. We had a full home and we were still going nuts. And then imagine putting us in a place where there's just enough room for us to kind of turn around a little bit and or, or just you know take four steps on the right and four steps on the left. So let's not let's not forget that when we use that tool let's realize that there's a price that the animals are paying and ask ourselves what could it be doing to the dogs is there another way to handle this Mm -hmm. there's also another aspect that i want to touch upon is the way they sleep dogs are are polyphasic sleepers that need a lot of sleep and they move between their bouts of sleep throughout the day to different places and they use the surface that they are on for uh, temperature regulation and you know giving them the right kind of neck support back support uh, so we we do a study in tourist class and now my students do this as well where we we observe what they do if you leave them by themselves what kind of places do they choose to sleep in and boy do they move a lot they want to move from place to place throughout the day for different reasons different surfaces uh, and not having that ability to move um, can drastically reduce the quality of sleep I think there are studies that have been done on many different animals that show that not feeling safe enough not having the right temperature not feeling having the right uh, you know, freedom of movement, uh, these things can impact the quality of sleep. Now, here you have it. The quality of sleep drops, they get crabby, they get irritable, they have behavioral problems, and then we're trying our best to train them and we're confining them more because now they're chewing up and shredding up things. So we want to keep them safe so we can find them again. We're stuck in a loop. Mm-hmm. And we have to break out of that loop and we have to, we can't continue to, have a blind uh, spot with with crates to say, okay, that's one thing that I will not look at and will not question. Try uh, not using it and see the impact that it has on behavior. Give it a month or two months, see the impact it has on behavior. Frequently we see that we, a lot of these uh, behaviors that are actually a result of uh, poor quality of sleep can get uh, sorted. And then there is also the impact on movement. I'm not uh, very uh, familiar with the impact on um, you know the the impact on the spine and um, the knees. Uh, I think um, uh, Julia uh, from Galen is uh, much well versed uh, with this topic. But I know that when when we were having chats, she was talking about this, saying that it does impact their growth, particularly if you do it at a puppy stage and things like that. We don't have enough evidence on that now, but I, that's a space I would watch out, look out for, because uh, it makes sense. It does make sense that if you don't have that ability to move sufficiently, it will impact your growth at the puppy stage. And if uh, geriatric dogs also can struggle a lot. Um, so the jury is out on this uh, in terms of, you know, how it can impact their health. Mental well-being, the jury isn't out on it. There's, there is enough evidence. Uh, we must be looking at it. We must use this tool with a lot more caution. It can't be used willy-nilly. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's such an important point. I think that's so well succinct how you've just put that there. I mean, it, it, it is a tool that is essentially social isolation we know is a, a kind of a primary punisher right it's we are built and what well, most social mammals are built to respond pretty strongly to social isolation and um we know that dogs are the same probably even possibly more so than us they are so so social and um, so if we are using a great particularly in that in a condition where a dog's on their own um then there, there is likely to be some unpleasantness for the animal um involved in that and um as well something that came up to me as well um obviously you're acutely aware of this telling me how hot it is in uh, where you are today if you're suddenly confined to a particular space and you can't move to regulate your temperature god how are you gonna sleep how are you gonna (laughs) even think about kind of anything i mean if i get too hot if i get too cold i'm putting on jackets you know i'm messing around with the heating i'm doing all sorts of trying change in temperature and dogs are more limited than us in in what they can do um, for that Um, it's not like we're leaving the remote to the air conditioner next to them for them to 
that's, that's not it, right? And they, they rely on movement for a lot. Um, uh, they don't have opposable thumbs. So they, they do rely on movement and they do rely on their body position in space um, to work through not just things like temperature, but even uh, what makes you feel safe, what makes you, um, uh, where do you feel comfortable? Uh, Chiru, for instance, is you know her her biggest criteria is being next to people and being next to me so she's most of the times right next to me but uh sometimes she doesn't want to be next to me she wants space from me usually that happens when i'm stressed when i'm kind of having an argument or i'm crying she wants to be away from me but at other times she wants to be close to me when i'm experiencing emotional distress and it's not like it's written in a marquee or across her forehead, right? It's not like, okay, this is the proximity level that I would appreciate for now. You have to give them that choice. Only then are you going to know what they need. And that can get challenging if you're going to restrict them. Yeah, yeah, it makes it harder, yeah, to learn, to learn from them and learn what, what they need, what they want. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, another really, um, really interesting thought on that as well. Um, so... Um, We've talked to sort of about crates kind of in the more general sense, but um, I suppose what in in kind of you've talked about in um, kind of airplane uh, transport, perhaps veterinary care as well, often using crates. Although actually, I have seen some brilliant vets now that kind of set up um, kind of whole pens for the animals, and um, I think that's really really valuable in terms of looking yeah. at how we can just make that experience a little bit more pleasant for yeah. a dog. Because if you'd gone in and had an operation or had a something probably quite unpleasant happen, unfortunately by nature of it, then it's always yeah. nice to think about how we can kind of mitigate some of the. Um, yeah, stresses afterwards, but realistically, obviously, um, not every vet can afford that. Some are in very small buildings, small locations. So do you think there's anything worth doing in terms of preparing um, dogs for that experience? So uh, I think for air travel, of course, yes, we do work with uh, crate training them well in advance, get them prepared for air travel. And uh, as much as the dogs look like they're handling it like you know, like a boss, they're really good at it. Uh, I do see that subsequently, uh, several months later, I get reports back from uh, people who are very uh, have a very good eye, often tell me, I, I kind of feel like they didn't handle it that well. And so that there is that danger that um, what happens with confinement, and I, I remember I trapped a mouse in a, uh, a little cage. I had a mouse in my earlier home and I trapped the mouse in the cage and when the mouse got trapped um, I expected the mouse to be thrashing about because the mouse is trapped the mouse is stressed I know that uh, and so I expect the mouse to be thrashing about but that's not what I saw the mouse was completely still and just sat in a corner and I moved the cage and I gave it to the person who was clearing it and I said you know leave leave the mouse outside um, and uh the mouse didn't move for the entire time, looked completely still. And I said, what happened when you left the mouse outside? He said, oh, he just, you know, walked out calmly and ran, uh, you know, once he realized where he was. Uh, uh, so there is that freeze response that frequently looks like calmness. I think that's a big danger that we have. And I think um, looking at the literature, at least, it looks like it's such a huge stressor that I don't think... I mean, we can do some amount of training, but I don't think it's necessarily doing away with the stressors. So I think the bigger question to ask ourselves is if they are in a situation where they are put in confinement for whatever periods of time, what can we do to help them recover from that? Because it can and it's likely to be a very traumatic experience. So what kind of a support can we do for them to recover from it? What can we do during that confinement? For instance, a lot of them can take uh, comfort in the presence of somebody comforting. So if I find, for instance, uh, the, the few times that I have worked with uh, 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 in shelters where they're very small confined areas where they put the dogs uh, one of the things that I have done as a volunteer is to go and sit and read to them and uh, that helps them it's just they're, they're in a panic state right and it's helping them to say okay breathe you know I'm here that that comforting presence um, 
uh, and the, the the recovery the the recovery after which is you know what do we need to do can we kind of a, do a detox can we do a lot of sleep cycles can we give you a lot of reassurance that you're now in a space where you're no more confined you've got your freedom i would focus more on those rather than trying to see if i can preempt this whole thing and make this somehow pleasant uh that's like saying can i get you trained to appreciate a jail uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd oh, like yeah. rather be that the therapy possible. afterwards. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I think that's really and I think, yeah, we, we know that animals when they're stressed, they're not very good at learning new things. Um, okay. other than think that things are bad, which they are quite good at learning <laughs> when they're stressed. Yeah. They're not very good at recalling um old yeah. memories either. So that if you however much training you've done, particularly when you've got a new factors, because inevitably you're going to have new factors coming when you're going on a plane because I mean, there's luggage being thrown around yeah. or there's some yeah. scary person in high vis doing weird things and there's yeah. all sorts going on or same if you're in the vets or in a shelter. It's going to be hard to, to s- simulate that situation, isn't it? And, yeah. and teach a dog that that's okay. And I think, yeah, you make a great point in terms of setting up to help the dog recover from that. And perhaps something else as well is thinking about building skills sort of more general coping skills and resilient skills in advance of that as well yeah Um, yeah absolutely yeah one of the things I hear a lot of people say is dogs uh, are dead animals they find it uh, they 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 find it safer in there Uh, and I think that's kind of what we go with and that's very comforting idea that ah you know uh, they find it safer in there uh couple of things first up uh i have been studying free living dogs for a long time now i there must be about a few million uh free living dogs in india if they were den animals we'd see their dens all over the place millions of them we don't we see them they 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 do not sleep in den like structures but this is very important to understand they can go in there when they are terrified to the point where they feel there is no option for them to run away and uh, keep themselves safe. So let's say that they have puppies and they know they cannot run away with their puppies and they have to hide. Or when we have fireworks, five days of fireworks, they've run helter-skelter, they've run everywhere that they can run and there is nowhere to run. Then they may back off into these hiding spaces. So if a dog is naturally going into these spaces, it really begs the question, what is the state of mind they're in? It's a state of mind where they're terrified and they see no option to run. Otherwise, an animal like a dog, the first thing they want to do is to, the minute they feel a little afraid, they want to be in a space where they can keep themselves safe. So at a height where they can watch and run away if if possible. Let's see if I can change the angle of this a little bit. Yeah, got the sun coming in. <laughs> yeah, the sun's setting on the back and so on. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's an important consideration. And, you know, if they, if they really were den animals who found it automatically found it, uh, you know, sensible to hide in a, in a, in a cage like structure, we wouldn't need to train them. We wouldn't need to do anything to prepare them. They would happily walk in and they would walk out refreshed and happy. That's not the case. That's why we are even having this discussion because that is not the case, right? And so I think it's important to understand what state of mind they're likely to be in when they go into a hole. Uh, That's why I'm trying to paint you this picture. Keep that in mind when we try to mitigate the effects of this experience that they had um, and try to factor that in when you're trying to help them with recovery. Yeah. I think that's yeah a brilliant kind of um yeah way of thinking about it and um, yeah so there's, there's just so much so much there is, isn't there in terms of the way that the, the yeah confinement restrictions are um put upon our animals one final thing that occurred to me with with, with crates as well is it's interesting the language that we use um around them and kind of how we've shifted from saying cages to crates because really crates are kind of what you, you vegetables come in and stuff really isn't it but yeah um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of shifted to to that. Um, yeah, it's sanitizing it. language, isn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. it uh, and uh, again, we are hiding behind words. Uh, I'm I'm not so sure that that does us any service. Uh, it's a confined space at the end of the day. It's a certain amount of cubic area that we are giving them, and 
again, a lot of these studies don't um, don't differentiate between crates and cages. Uh, most of them study the cubic area of confinement, the amount of enrichment and the social contact they have in there. And we see that the, the less cubic area you give them, uh, the more stress we see in you know, almost all individuals, uh, almost all species that can move. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. So it's been brilliant to talk to you today. I'm conscious we're coming to the end of an hour and I've got so many things I could, could go on to ask you about, um, but I'll probably keep you here all day. Um, so I think probably best we start wrapping up. Um, the final thing I wanted to or hope we can touch on is um, today, obviously, you mentioned that um, you'd like to make an appeal for the brilliant charity Care. And um, so I think perhaps if you if you can, the last five minutes, just can you tell us a little bit about what they do and the work that they've done? Yeah. Sure. So I uh, I uh, always tell people that when we talk about uh, free living dogs, there's so much we can learn from them. Uh, even today, we have spoken about free living dogs so many times in this conversation, so much we can learn from them. Um, I think whether it be anthropology or anthrozoology, if you're learning from other individuals by observing them, we have to benefit them. Uh, and so um, I, you know, that's the reason why I appeal to people to um, support CARE. CARE is an organization that helps with uh, providing medical intervention for free living dogs. Uh, I love what uh, Sudha says about CARE. She says, uh, Sudha is the founder of CARE and she says, I want to make sure that every streetie has access to the quality of medical support that Chiru or Nishi would have. And that's her vision. And I think that's a beautiful one. They provide medical intervention and then they return the dogs back to where they belong on the street as required by the law in this country um, and uh, they don't uh, cut corners because these are vulnerable individuals they just do their best for them uh, and have some of the state-of-the-art medical facilities in there for these animals so I would appeal to people to uh, please make a if you've learned anything useful today then please think of the dogs that helped you arrive at that information and knowledge and make a little bit of a donation to care Fantastic. And I've just put the link for care as well in the comments. Um, so if you are able to just you can just hop over there and um, it's super easy. So you can just go to the donate page and on the I think it's under help us or sort of donate and they do international donations as well. So it doesn't matter where you're from. You can still yeah um, donate nice and easily. So, um, yeah definitely do if you get the chance it sounds like they make a real difference to to dogs lives and um, which is great so yeah once again thank you so much um for coming along and talking today it's been just so great talking to you and thinking about yeah so many different concepts but yeah kind of particularly that kind of biopower element and um yeah the control that we do have and the power that we do have over our dogs um oh yeah the other thing i just wanted to just for for those that that don't know you and want to find out more about you and um, can you perhaps just yeah share just perhaps a little bit about kind of what you've got going on and what 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 you've got coming up for those that want to learn more from you as well because I'm sure yeah. lots of people do <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you'd like to know more about what I uh, what I talk about, uh, I mean, the easiest way to do it would probably be, I finally managed to remember, oh, this is all flipped to the other <laughs> side, but this is dog nose, not gob, whatever. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, dog nose is my book, Learning to Learn from Dogs. Uh, it's available internationally. You can pick it up. Um, I also have uh, a, a short 20 hour uh, workshop, uh, online workshop called Canine Essential 101. Uh, you can sign up for that anytime. Uh, I can share the link on the comments as well. Um, and we talk about an introduction to the Bach's way, which is introduction to the ideas of biosocial psychology, applied ethology, um, zoo semiotics, which is how animals communicate with each other and how they communicate with us and how they read our body language, which is which is going to be the topic of my dissertation. Oh, <laughs> this, this wow. Year. wow. When, when are you publishing? <laughs> Let's see when I get <laughs> done with it. <laughs> well, good luck with it as well. <laughs> yeah. I'll be able to have a read of it if, um, <laughs> if yes. you do get it published. 
um i'm i'm hoping to get some funds to get a trap camera out here on the tree so that i can watch the dogs communicate with each other and how they uh, respond to us and their social lives so um for people who sign up for canine essential 101 we have special access to what we call the box auditorium we have two or three live sessions every month, uh, virtual live sessions every month where we uh, look at these videos from the farm or we talk, pick up some really contentious, difficult topics and we kind of pick them apart and uh, we're quite fearless about that. Um, and, and we look at ourselves uh, honestly and very reflexively. Uh, we bring in a lot of reflexivity into it. Uh, so that is also something that uh, people who sign up for canine essential 101 can try out and that's what i have going on so i have a few snippets of those live sessions on our box social media we have we are on uh, instagram and uh, facebook and youtube as well and we have a website www.box.com fantastic <laughs> that's box with b-h-a-r-c-s yes that's <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> great fantastic so if, you, if you're able to share that in the comments then that would be amazing and so yeah, i'm right. sure people will be able to find it Okay, well, great. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great talking to you and hopefully we'll see you soon. Yes, uh, this was, this was, uh, I was quite nervous about talking about this because <laughs> it's a very, very emotive topic. Uh, thank you for creating the space for it. Thank you for hearing me out. We don't have to agree on everything, but just the fact that uh, you even hear me out means a lot to me. And yeah. I hope that it's the beginning of a conversation. Yeah, and what I would say is the comments, I've been sort of just flicking through them now, um, got some really fantastic comments and some fantastic feedback. So um, <laughs> certainly with the listeners, so I it don't looks have like to things, hide. you don't have to, we, we're not cancelled. Uh, <laughs> it's all looking okay. Um, so um, yeah, some really lovely feedback written there. So if you get the chance to have a look at it, um, it's I worth bet. doing as you got some brilliant feedback about, I think some people that have done your course as well. Um, so yeah so thank you all for coming along and thank you again and I'll see you all at the next live thanks bye, -bye. thank you <laughs>